Uh, my name's John Husson. I've been around much too long. <laughs> but I just want to say, uh, we've got a wonderful president in Chris Burden. One of my um, more challenging uh, responsibilities at the museum the past few years has been program chairman. Um, and as I look back, we've done the history of a lot of things. We've had programs about the history of Manchester furniture, about the history of our local sea captains, about Manchester architecture, but we've never touched on the history, the natural history of our beloved Manchester by the sea. And how fortunate we are this evening to have somebody who can really share that story with us. Chris Leahy has been a professional conservationist for more than 30 years and served as director of the Mass Audubon's Center for Biological Conservation. His interests in natural history are comprehensive, and he's a recognized authority on not only birds, but insects. He is also the editor of a series of authoritative books on the flora and fauna of New England, and Chris has designed and has led natural history explorations in over 70 countries all over the continents. He is especially fascinated with the world's few remaining wilderness areas, and the biologic biodiversity hotspots such as Gabon and Madagascar and Mongolia. He grew up in Marblehead, and he lives with Gloucester, with his family, since the 1970s. And Chris, we're so glad you're with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you so much, John. Um, uh, and thank you uh, for inviting me to address your, your annual meeting. I, um, I, I learned and I'm very impressed that this is your 130th annual meeting. I, I work for the Mass Audubon Society and I always think of us as one of the venerable organizations of the Commonwealth. Uh, and we're just coming up on our 120th uh, annual meeting, so I'm extremely impressed. Uh, but I probably shouldn't be surprised coming from this part of the, of the world. As John said when we were discussing this, uh, you, you know, uh, your organization, um, and it was, it was wonderful. I, I listened to quite a lot of business meetings in the course of doing talks, and I would have to say that this is one of the more interesting business meetings I've heard, uh, just because of hearing all the wonderful things that uh, your organization is doing. Um, as John said, you focus, obviously, on human history. And so we thought it might be fun tonight to uh, focus on uh, natural history, of which arguably human history is a part. Um, and so my kind of goal tonight is to uh, give you a, a, a sort of an overview of uh, hopefully of places and things, of organisms that you might not have realized uh, uh, live here in, in your community, right alongside you, uh, probably in some cases almost within walking distance, but you didn't know uh, uh, we're here. So uh, you're gonna see a lot of pictures, pro probably pretty rapidly, um, and I'll try to tell you things that I hope will sort of be of interest uh, uh, in that context. Uh, well, let's see, I'll figure out how this goes. Oh, wrong side. Oh, there we go. Yeah. All right, I think we're ready. Now, thanks to Beth, actually, for giving superb tech help here uh, in terms of uh, using this advanced mechanism. So, uh, this probably doesn't strike you. Can you hear me if I stand apart from the mic? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. I kind of like to walk around and move my arms and stuff like that. So, um, Irish background, I guess. So this doesn't probably strike you as a typical uh, Manchester uh, theme. Uh, but in fact, if we go far enough back, I'm going to start with sort of the history of natural history, if you will. If you go far enough back, uh, there's a little bit of Manchester in this. Uh, because uh, this part of the world, this part of Massachusetts, actually started um, in a vol volcanic activity. Uh, about somewhere between uh, a billion and uh, 500 million years ago. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the general concept of uh, plate tectonics. Uh, I'm old enough to have sat in my uh, school classroom and seen how you know, uh, South America and Africa seemed to fit together. But in those days, it was like, no, 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 that's crazy. The continent didn't move around. But in the 1960s, of course, we found out, oh, yes, they did. Um, and so there have been three sort of super continents. And this is the first one, uh, Rodinia. Uh, Rodinia actually comes from, a, Latin, uh, from a, a Russian term that means the motherland. So this is the motherland of all motherlands. This was the place where all the continents smushed together for the first time. And there have been three of those. Um, and if, you, um, if you, you, you can see on the, on the 
map here. Here's Massachusetts. A um, billion years ago or so, sort of stuck in there. And these sort of red spots are sort of plutons, sort of volcanic uh, you know, eruptions of magma that kind of connected to these uh, supercontinents, okay? Um, and eventually, there were three of these. The one that followed the Rodinia was uh, uh, um, uh, Gondwana, which I'm sure you all, all heard of. At some point, um, you know, the, the, the Canadian, North American part shifted off. I won't go into all the details. What you want to think about is that all of these supercontinents floated around the globe, this all took millions of years, floated around the globe and then came back together again a number of times, banging into each other uh, every time they did that. And what I want to draw your attention to here is that here's North America, here's Africa, whoops, here, whoops, wrong way, um, here's Africa, okay, and here's this, here's this place that kind of, Manchester is in here somewhere, okay? <laughs> Ma Eastern Massachusetts. And what you want to think about is that these things kind of banged into each other several times, and then they all separated. And the last continent was uh, called uh, Pangaea, and that separation, that last movement of the big, these big continents is still going on. They're still separating, okay? Um, but, and... If you look at this map, this depiction of that, this kind of shows that movement. And if you look at this, uh, this little red strip here, and as it floats sort of north and keeps banging into each other, again, that's Manchester, or eastern Massachusetts, so to speak. And, and here's how it ends up. It ends up as what's called the Avalon Terrain. And that piece that I took you back a million years ago to its, uh, who, its early development is this piece of Massachusetts. And of course, here's Cape Ann, here's Manchester, right in there, sort of somewhere. And so uh, the history of Manchester, or at least the natural history of Manchester, goes back, as I think I've demonstrated, uh, a long way. Um, so the rocks in this part of the world are you know, essentially 500 million years old, more or less. The next geological event that really um, you can see on the landscape, you can still see on the landscape. Uh, has to do with the, the last, there have been several ice ages, of course, uh, but the last one was so, the so-called Laurentian uh, ice sheet. Um, and it started retreating, uh, this last one started retreating about 20, 21,000 uh, years ago, so fairly recent history compared to what I just described. Um, and this one kind of shows uh, these stages. And so here's 16,000 years ago, uh, still Manchester would have been covered with ice, 13,000, a few thousand years more, and that ice begins to recede. Okay, so what happens then? The ice has receded, um, it has left behind, oh well, worth mentioning that uh, during that period, uh, Manchester was covered by about 4,000 feet of ice. <laughs> Okay, so fairly deeply and heavily buried under a lot of ice. Uh, and that ice sheet, of course, left uh, uh, spectacular uh, changes and uh, uh, pits and hummocks and hills and various other geological features uh, sort of on the landscape, uh, some of which are described in this, uh, in this slide. And anybody that's walked in the woods anywhere on Cape Ann has seen the remnants of that, uh, that last ice sheet, uh, scenes such as this. Um, and there's little Agassiz Rock, a uh, classic glacial erratic, uh, which came not just from, you know, sort of uh, Boxford, uh, but probably uh, many, many miles away carried by this, uh, by this great, uh, great glacier. Uh, so once this glacier retreated, um, uh, uh, this is actually one of the few uh, glaciers in the world that is still advancing. This is in the uh, Argentine Andes in, in Patagonia. Um, once that retreated, you know, we didn't all of a sudden get, you know, trees and, you know, uh, wildflowers and things like that. Uh, the land was at first quite barren. It was a glacial desert. And then, gradually, what you want to think about is as time went by, it very much replicated what we see on the landscape as you go from north to south. So this is Arctic tundra. This is Arctic Canada today, okay? And this is more or less what it would have looked like. Uh, a few hundred years or maybe a thousand years or so after that glacier uh, retreated for the last time. As you can see, flowering plants uh, beginning to come in, but of course uh, long winters uh, and that kind of thing. And of course not the same lighting conditions as you have had in the high Arctic. As the climate began to warm, uh, the distance between the glacier uh, advanced, uh, you began to get uh, this boreal landscape, again, thinking about 
uh, boreal North America, going from the tundra uh, southward into coniferous forests, looking very much like this, so that Manchester, arguably, would have uh, had landscapes uh, that looked very much like this. And then gradually uh, transitioning to a very robust uh, mixed forest of hardwoods and, uh, and softwoods, uh, dominated by oaks and pines. Um, this part of the world, Cape Ann, probably did not have the largest uh, trees in Massachusetts, but, the, but certainly some, some great trees. This happens to be an oak, but the largest pines, and white pine was one of the major uh, sort of projects as well as, of course, of landscape features, but it was one of the first things that a lot of the colonists um, uh, used, uh, exploited, uh, for export. So that some of the biggest white pines were uh, six feet in diameter and reached a height of 250 feet, which just to give you a sense of that, is about the height of uh, the Amazon rainforest, some of the larger areas of the Amazon rainforest. So there was a very robust uh, forest community here, probably not in the 250 foot range here on Cape Ann because of the very uh, shallow soils and the lack of deep soils here, but still some pretty big trees. Um, and then we came along. <laughs> and um, it didn't take us long to see that there were products, there was, there was business to be had, uh, products to be sold, especially to the United Kingdom uh, and elsewhere in Europe. And this is a depiction, uh, this is one of the Harvard Forest dioramas. If you've never been to the Harvard Forest Museum uh, and seen their series of dioramas of changing landscapes in New England, it's definitely worth taking in the next time you're in central Massachusetts, in Petersham, where this is. And this landscape is typical of what Massachusetts looked like uh, during uh, Thoreau's time, let us say, the mid 1800s, something like that, when it was the, the center of the farming uh, period. Uh, most of the land had been cleared, um, and, uh, and it was before the Industrial Revolution and the factories, et cetera, and before people had figured out that it wasn't really worth much farming rocks in New England when there was good soil to be had in Ohio and people started moving west. Uh, so this was the, ne the, the next stage and that we created as we arrived on the scene, and this is kind of like what uh, Cape Ann ended up looking like. This is actually um, uh, most of this area, particularly because of the, uh, the poor soils, it was cleared very, very quickly. Um, and sheep put out in most of these sort of areas. And so then, uh, as again, the factories came along and the, the farming was more or less abandoned, it began, began to slightly come back. So this is a picture of Dogtown, which we're all familiar with, sort of in the uh, Gloucester and Rockport, but much of the coastal area of Massachusetts, uh, Marblehead, Marblehead Neck and whatever, looked a, a lot like this or even sort of more barren with the bare rock geology uh, showing very clearly. And as it continued, this natural succession of vegetation after the farming period, you end up with a kind of a, a shrub uh, community. This is uh, um, Shadbush, uh, this wonderful thing that happens uh, throughout Cape Ann, throughout New England really, but I always think Cape Ann has a particularly spectacular version of it, so that between late April and sort of mid-May, three species of um, you know, Juneberry or Shadbush, uh, as it's called, um, bloom for about 10 days, and if you get out during that period, it's a, a great spectacle. Uh, but this is also a, a, a stage in the succession of the vegetation that eventually will lead to, you know, after uh, hundreds of years, back to, to forest. And that's what it's finally uh, done, uh, and uh, as I'll speak about in more detail, uh, Manchester now is essentially, and as, Mas as is Massachusetts, uh, essentially a forested landscape. We've gone from 75% deforested in Thoreau's day to now about 80% reforested, not going back to quite the robust structure of the primeval forest, but uh, seriously forested throughout the state. During this period, um, the species composition changed uh, quite a good deal. This is a, a timber, an eastern timber rattlesnake. Okay? In, uh, those, in the early days, when the first settlers, when the first uh, European settlers arrived, um, timber rattlesnakes were common. Uh, they, currently, there are records of them here in Manchester. If you look at a map of Massachusetts uh, that has the local landmarks mark, you will see many, many, many rattlesnake hills. Uh, uh, timber rattlesnake is now an endangered species on the endangered species list. It occurs in the Blue Hills, 
uh, at one site in the Berkshires and one site in central Massachusetts. And you may have heard the news that uh, my colleague Tom French is trying to get them reintroduced onto an uninhabited island in the middle of Quabbin and having some, having some PR problems with that. Uh, <laughs> But, but the big picture is this went from a common but not much cherished organism uh, to a very, very rare organism, strictly because people, whenever they saw a rattlesnake, boom, uh, it was gone. Uh, you know, with some justification. Rattlesnakes can be quite harmful if you don't know how to deal with them. Uh, this is kind of the opposite example uh, <laughs> in many ways, right? <laughs> uh, this is, I don't have to tell you what this is, right? <laughs> uh, this is a beaver, <laughs> and beavers were, uh, like rattlesnakes, essentially extirpated, even more so than rattlesnakes. They were extirpated in New England. Why? Again, same reason that the white pines uh, got cut down. Uh, beaver fur was much valued in, uh, in Europe and the continent and the UK, and so the beavers were exterminated. But guess what? <laughs> they're back. <laughs> and uh, they're back partly due to some reintroductions. Uh, there was a reintroduction in the 1920s in the Berkshires, but mainly it's because um, uh, lack of pressure on them. Uh, no, the, the trapping, there's still trapping, including trapping of beavers, but far less than there was, far less commercial trapping. Uh, and the forest and habitat that beavers need um, is, has also sort of come back. So this is a success story, unless you happen to live right next to some beaver workings and your basement is flooded. Uh, but from the beaver's point of view, and from Mass Audubon's point of view, this is a success story uh, quite different from that of the, of the rattlesnake. So what I'm going to do now is to kind of take you on a sort of a, a tour of uh, Manchester landscapes, so to speak, and seascapes, uh, and give you a kind of an overview of the different habitats that you live with. And hopefully, a lot of the things, uh, my, my best hope for this evening will be that you will say, wow, I didn't know that there was so much of this so nearby, and what a rich natural history there is here. Um, it always amazes me that in a place that is so heavily settled, when you think of how thickly settled Essex County is, Cape Ann is, Manchester is, uh, there's an amazing amount of natural wealth. So this is the wild North Atlantic. I always think of it as the, the greatest of oceans. I've been on all of, pretty much all of the world's oceans, and this one's the one that has the most character. So, uh, so talk a little bit about uh, uh, this is a seacoast town. There are probably a bunch of sailors in the room. I'm sure you've all been out on whale watches and things like that. So I think even though uh, Stellwagen Bank Marine Sanctuary isn't actually in the town of Manchester, I think it's fair to include some of these pelagic things. And we include everything from you know, single cell organisms like uh, colonies of diatoms and things like this, uh, exquisite but tiny, and you never see them unless you're in a lab or uh, seeing a picture, uh, and this wonder sort of planktonic life of, of jellyfish and, and larval organisms sort of of all kinds. Uh, all the way to these sort of major sort of uh, predators, pelagic fish such as bluefin tuna, uh, of which uh, this is a part of its global range. Um, and then a, a whole range of other fishes that, again, we don't get to see unless we hang out on the wharfs or no fishermen uh, and see some of the amazing things they bring in, uh, in addition to the usual sort of, you know, haddock and cod and things like that. That's so cod these days, I guess. This is something called a moonfish, uh, also called a dollar fish. It, it is kind of, if I turned it one the other way, it's about as thin as a silver dollar. And it's a uh, species that occurs in sort of Gulf Stream eddies that occur here ev every summer. And the fishermen bring them in every year. You can see by the context of the palm how, how small it is. Uh, bottom feeders, uh, like this uh, sea raven. Anybody know why a sea raven is called a sea raven? It's not black. It doesn't fly. It's not a bird. It croaks. Uh, ravens have a croaking sound, a kind of call. And these guys, when you bring them, I was a, grew up in Marblehead, and when you fished for these things and brought one of these up and put it on the deck, they make a croaking sound. So that's why they're called sea ravens. Anyway, a magnificently ugly species. Uh, and then there are fishes that could be called sort of uh, keystone uh, species in the food chain. This is something called a sand lance. It occurs uh, sporadically in different seasons occasionally and many times in abundant numbers. And so it is a food fish for many organisms, including uh, one of our local favorites, uh, humpback whale, which of course uh, breed in the tropics on silverback down in the Dominican Republic, um, but don't feed down there because tropical waters have very poor nutrients and have to come to our nice uh, nutrient-rich uh, uh, cold waters uh, here on Cape Ann, Stellwagen Bank, to, uh, uh, to rear their young. Uh, 
also a host of seabirds. And one of the things about the seabirds that occur, the so-called pelagic birds that occur uh, especially offshore and that you seldom see from land, is that they connect us in very interesting ways with the rest of the world. This is something called a Wilson storm petrel. Petrel comes from St. Peter, and maybe this picture will suggest why. Uh, they have a habit of looking like they walk on the water. They don't actually walk on the water, uh, but they paddle. They have yellow webs in their feet, and they kind of skitter over the surface and paddle the water. And the theory is, nobody's asked a Wilson Storm Petrel about this, but uh, <laughs> that, that somehow they're stirring up the plankton, or the plankton are somehow attracted to the yellow feet, and then they go with that little delicate bill and, and pick them out. These are birds are relative, uh, are relatives of albatrosses, though they're about the size of a swallow, not much bigger than a purple martin, for example. Uh, and if you've ever uh, been sailing, I'm sure you've seen these black and white birds uh, out off, off the coast. One of the most interesting things about them is that they are uh, summer visitors for us, but they're, it's their winter because they breed. Some people have said that this might be the most abundant bird in the world, uh, and it breeds on sea cliffs all around Antarctica, okay? And comes here for their winter, uh, but our summer. So they're our connection, uh, among other things, to uh, Antarctica. This is another spectacular seabird that is common along our coast. It's something called the northern gannet. Um, it's a big bird, the size of a small albatross with a six-foot wingspan. Um, and if you go uh, along the Manchester coast, especially like in April, March, April, maybe early May, and then again in uh, October and November, you can see these birds passing and feeding sometimes in large numbers. Uh, they nest on uh, rock cliffs in Newfoundland, Labrador, Quebec, uh, places like this. And one of the great things about watching gannets is their manner of feeding. They're called plunge divers. And this is what they do. Uh, they soar in the air at quite uh, high uh, uh, heights, as you can see, um, and can see fish uh, feeding along the surface. And then when they see usually a school of fish, uh, they plunge right into it. They have specially modified skulls uh, so that they don't get severe headaches from doing this. Uh, uh, but you can see how the, the trajectory goes. And when they end up hitting the water, it's like a spear uh, hitting the water. And when they go down, you're sometimes like, well, is it ever going to come up? But it finally does. So they penetrate quite low, quite deep uh, in the water. One of the things that's distinctive about Cape Ann uh, in general, and Manchester in particular, is that it's a rock-bound coast. Okay? And rocky coasts are relatively rare in the world. Uh, there are relatively few rocky coasts as opposed to sandy coasts. So even though we take it for granted, it's like, yeah, you go down to the shore and it's rocks, uh, it's actually quite unusual if you look at it from a from a global point of view. And within that rocky zone, the so-called intertidal zone and the subtidal zone, there's another whole world that you seldom get to see uh, unless you have access to a marine lab or take your kids looking at tide pools and things like that. So there are creatures like uh, this uh, sun star. This is a species that's actually called purple sun star, but it comes in colors all the way from yellow to purple. So this is kind of the mid-range. Uh, mid and you can see the sea urchins there as well. Uh, and this incredibly common uh, organism called red-gilled nudibranch, or less poetically, sea slug. Uh, <laughs> but again, a common sort of tide pool organism uh, that you have to go uh, looking for to be able to, uh, to appreciate. Um, our rock-bound coast is also home to uh, harbor seals. Uh, harbor seals breed in Maine and come down here mainly in the fall and for the winter, and then mainly sort of go back. Uh, but we are now beginning to see a second species of seal in this area, uh, and that's this guy, uh, <laughs> who doesn't look very good, never looks like a very comfortable possible to me, but they seem to like it all right. So this is the gray seal, and they do kind of the opposite thing. They breed on Nantucket uh, and the remote areas of Cape Cod, Monomoy, etc., and they are on the increase, and as they increase, they're moving north rather than south. And so it's now quite common to see these gray seals. They're also called horsehead seals. I probably don't have to explain why. Uh, but you can often see them, the, the, the local guys, the fishermen in Gloucester, if you go out to the fish pier, uh, they often feed seals of both species. Uh, and also a toss of fish, and these horse heads will come in and, and sort of gobble them up. So we now have two uh, native seals. This is also, uh, these rocky coasts are also wonderful places for uh, seabirds, sea ducks along the coast and especially during the winter. So a couple of species of our more, more spectacular sea ducks. This is something that used to be called uh, the old squaw, 
Uh, you can probably sort of <laughs> guess why. Um, uh, but the name was changed recently because these birds were declining greatly uh, in the Alaskan area. And they wanted to um, encourage the native people to help. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to uh, convince the native uh, peoples to um, help them survey for these old squaws. And they decided that that probably wasn't the most diplomatic name. <laughs> Manages to be kind of, you know, sexist and racist and, you know, uh, you know ageist all at the same time. So they petitioned the American Ornithologist Union to change the name to Long-Tailed Duck. And so that's, it, it does indeed have a long, sort of, uh, very beautiful sort of pin tail. This is an Arctic breeder, breeds in high in the Arctic tundra, uh, comes down here for the winter. Massachusetts, unlike the Alaskan area, has one of the largest wintering populations, uh, about a half a million of these birds uh, that uh, uh, winter in, in Nantucket Sound. Uh, and this beautiful duck, the, the harlequin duck, uh, again, a rocky coast uh, specialist that breeds uh, along fast flowing rivers. And then when it comes south after the rivers freeze up, it feeds along these very high wave action, very dynamic uh, coastal areas feeding on periwinkles and limpets uh, and things like that. I talked to someone who was studying the northeastern population of uh, harlequin ducks because I noticed that one of the local birds was banded. They'll often get up on the rocks. And um, I, so I asked him about you know, the demographics and where these birds go and whatever. And at least some of these birds summer as far away. Our birds are you know, Cape Ann, Harlequin duck summer as far away as Greenland. Okay, so again, long distance migrants. And this is another s a winter specialty of rocky coasts, uh, an Arctic breeding sandpiper called purple sandpiper. A little bit of a color exaggeration there, but you get the idea. Uh, <laughs> but again, especially of, of uh, rocky coasts uh, here in the winter. Um, one of the great specialties of Manchester in terms of bird life is uh, Kettle Island, that you see here, uh, that Mass Audubon now owns and manages. And this is uh, arguably the most important uh, colony of wading birds in New England. Okay? So there are hundreds of snowy egrets, uh, as well as great egrets, uh, black crowned night herons, uh, glossy ibis, uh, breeding on this island. Uh, uh, it's the, by far the largest percentage of these wading birds uh, that occurs anywhere uh, in Massachusetts and, and indeed in, in New England. So that if you go to Plum Island or look in the marshes uh, around here and see these birds, virtually all of them are coming from the great colony on Kettle Island, which started out on House Island. Uh, they abandoned that almost immediately in one year and moved to Kettle and have been there for the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, these islands are protected. There's a, uh, a global conservation project called Important Bird Areas. And one of the areas that I, uh, there were bird experts from all over the Commonwealth that were brought in to propose these areas. There are 79 of them now in Massachusetts. And I proposed uh, three of them, well, I guess uh, more like four or five, but three of them on Cape Ann. And one of them is, kind of, uh, is this kind of Essex County coastal bird islands. Um, and you can see the, the delineation of the important uh, uh, bird areas, which of course includes Kettle Island, but also many other islands uh, that contain colonies of nesting uh, seabirds of various kinds. Um, Manchester doesn't have a lot of sort of sandy beach, uh, but it does have some. And sandy beaches, of course, have their own uh, special inhabitants. Uh, this is one of the ones that you only see usually in shell form along the beach. This is the great moon snail. There are a couple of species of moon snails. And you can see that this purple thing is its foot, its means of uh, uh, traveling around in the sand. And the object you see in the background is called a sand collar. And this uh, 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 mollusk uh, embeds its eggs in sort of a, a glutinous mass in this sand collar. Uh, and that's how it, uh, how it reproduces. Uh, so that's one uh, quintessential uh, sand uh, inhabitant. Another is a variety of shorebirds. This is a flock of, a mixed flock of sanderlings, the sort of more white-headed, shorter build ones, uh, and dunlin. And again, virtually all of the shorebirds, the sandpipers and plovers that visit Massachusetts are high Arctic breeders uh, and come here only uh, during migration. The sanderling, in this case, migrates, one of the longest distance migrants in the world, migrating all the way to the southern tip of South America. Uh, the Dunlin, how however, it also winters here, so it has a very broad wintering range. Uh, the Dunlin, also an Arctic breeder, uh, often winters here and doesn't go nearly as far south. So just a reminder that all bird species have their own particular uh, way, of, way of being. Um, Manchester also doesn't have a lot of salt marsh. Uh, 
Uh, but it does have a, quite a wonderful one. This is Wolf Creek, you will all uh, recognize. And this is another habitat uh, with very specialized organisms. Uh, uh, that's kind of characteristic of some of these uh, uh, ecosystems that they all have species that, are, that really tolerate no other uh, kind of habitat. Again, a wonderful place for uh, migrating shorebirds like these greater yellow legs. Uh, but also some species that really occur only in salt marsh. This is something called the salt marsh sparrow. Um, and if salt marshes go away, and we're a little worried about that in terms of climate change and sea level rise, this species goes away. So while it's in reasonably good shape right now, uh, it's a species that may shortly be in decline. These marshes also have characteristic uh, invertebrates. Um, this is something called the common wood nymph, which implies that it inhabits wooded areas, which it doesn't. It does inhabit other grassy areas, but its favorite habitat is the grasslands, and that's what a, a salt marsh really is. It's a, an intertidal grassland. Um, and this grassland has its own uh, dragonfly species, the salt marsh dragonfly, uh, which uh, again occurs only in that particular habitat. Connecting the sea with uh, inland freshwater um, are a variety of streams running to the sea. Uh, Wolf Creek is a place where uh, the watershed comes down, goes through the salt marsh and out to sea, and is also a highway up into spawning grounds for several species of anadromous fishes. That is to say, fishes that live in the ocean but spawn in fresh water. Uh, perhaps the most uh, spectacular one in this area um, is the alewife. Um, I'm not sure about specific uh, alewife runs here in Manchester, but Cape Ann has a number of them. There's a new run that's been recently restored uh, in Gloucester, and you can see these runs, in, uh, especially in April, um, at a number of places, especially sort of in Essex um, and Gloucester, and maybe here in Manchester. Uh, some of you may know of these, but they're spectacular uh, and look very much like this, as you can see, large movements of fishes. Manchester also doesn't have a lot of sort of upland uh, grasslands, um, but it does have a few very spectacular ones. This is Winthrop Field, as you'll all recognize. And these are habitats that are very much of concern to Mass Audubon and other people interested in bird conservation. It's a habitat that we're losing, uh, both because, again, the forests are coming back, farming is more or less in decline, um, and so we're losing a lot of the grassland bird species it used to be very common. Things like, um, things like bobolink, um, spectacular bird, which the last I knew was still breeding in Winthrop Field. Uh, Winthrop Field, I know, is being managed. The trick here is to mow the fields so that you're not mowing the young birds down uh, with the harvest, but letting the fields uh, mature enough so that the young bobolinks can, can mature. And then this bird, which used to be a, a common species uh, anywhere there was a little bit of farmland, sort of on Cape Ann, uh, eastern meadowlark, which has now declined precipitously, and so it's, uh, it's doubtful whether there are any breeding except for a few sites in northern Essex County now, uh, for again, a variety of reasons I'll talk about. And then there's this field. Uh, you probably have a local name for it. I don't. I call it the Ragged Robin Field. Uh, I'm sure you all recognize where it is. It's on Summer Street, east of, east of town. Um, and at this time of year, if you haven't been by it recently, I'd urge you to go buy it, you know, within the next few days, because at this time of year, it breaks out into this amazing bloom of this wildflower called uh, Ragged Robin. It's in the, the pink family, the Sweet William family, so to speak, and um, looks like this. Um, it's a non-native species, but not an invasive species, very sort of attractive uh, species, and for about 10 days, it just sort of covers uh, these fields. This field, this grassland, is of a different character than the Winthrop field. It's more wet. Uh, it's a kind of a wet meadow kind of habitat, and it has its own uh, flora. This is something called um, uh, lance-leafed violet, and it is the exclusive food plant of this species, silver-bordered fritillary. And so again, butterflies, as you know, are very closely tied to their larval food plants. The larval food plants are very much tied to a particular kind of habitat. So where you have wet meadows, you're likely to have lance leaf violets. Where you have lance leaf violets, you're likely to have uh, silver-bordered fritillaries. But again, this is a species of concern, which is uh, colonies of which have been declining within the last uh, couple of years. Um, then there are these odd little habitats that you might not think of as discrete habitats at all. Uh, this again, of course, is um, little Agassiz rock. And these balls, as they're so called, 
uh, are often subject to natural fires due to uh, hurricanes, um, and sometimes accidental fires due to beer parties and things like that. Uh, and what that produces is uh, a sort of an open country habitat, a shrubby habitat with open rock. And this is a home for a very distinctive home for a number of distinctive species. Um, so I mentioned fire. This is actually a prescribed burn, uh, which we're thinking about uh, working on for uh, some of these heathy areas uh, on Cape Ann. Um, and once those burns occur, they create uh, a hitherto uh, unrealized habitat for open country birds like whippoorwill. Uh, I bet there may be people in this room who remember hearing whippoorwills in Manchester within their, their lifetime, but I only know of one place now on Cape Ann, one area on Cape Ann where you can sort of now hear them, basically because their habitat has grown up. And the places where they still occur is a place where there was a fire about 20 uh, years ago. Um, also, other shrub birds, scrub birds, like this uh, eastern towhee, uh, which once the trees get too high, uh, it won't do for them. And I have to show at least one beetle. Uh, this is a state-listed tiger beetle. Uh, it's the uh, uh, rufous-vented tiger beetle, and it occurs only in a few rocky bald sites, A, in the Blue Hills, and B, on Cape Ann. So watch for this when you're out rocking about <laughs> rocky balls, when you're doing one of your hikes up to uh, one of these rocky bald areas. Um, what, uh, I mentioned that the forest has kind of come back, and really sort of the, the glory habitat of Manchester in terms of uh, richness and what Manchester has a lot of and very good examples of is forests and the wetlands that occur sort of in conjunction with these forests. Um, it's a mixed forest here. It's a forest that's uh, basically a mix of oak, black and red oak, uh, black cherry um, and white pine and uh, formerly eastern hemlock, although I'll talk about that. So it's a mixed kind of forest. Um, not as rich in species, perhaps, as some of the uh, sweeter uh, soil forests in the Berkshires, but still uh, very rich indeed. This is one of the plant stars of Manchester. Uh, this is something called small world pagonia. I always have to explain that because people usually think one is saying small world, as in it's a small world, uh, and begonia with a B, but no, this is small world because the leaves, as you see, are in whorls. And it's a pogonia, uh, which is a genus of orchid. This is a globally rare plant uh, that was discovered in uh, Manchester, oh, I don't know, probably 30 or more years ago now, probably going back to the old botanical records, maybe in the 19th century, and had to be relocated. Uh, but there are only a few sites in Manchester, and these are among the few uh, sites in the world for this species. Um, who knows what this is? If I say this is your state flower, you know what it is. What's that? Dogwood. Yes, Mayflower. Yes, Tra trailing arbutus. Yeah. So I just I'll like to remind you what your state flower is. And uh, and as we talked about with the forests coming back, a lot of forest creatures are coming back with us that haven't been uh, in this part of the world for uh, many many generations. Uh, this is a fisher, uh, sometimes called a fisher cat. It is not a cat. It is a large arboreal weasel uh, that uh, climbs around the trees and eats uh, squirrels. And it's one of the few uh, animals that can tackle a porcupine and get away with it. Uh, so that's one of their main food sources. Uh, also good if you have some of them around. And they are around. I've seen them in East Gloucester. I live in downtown Gloucester. And we've had them run through our backyard and things. Um, if you've got one nearby, uh, don't let your cat out. A uh, number of reasons not to do that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, one of the nice things about the revival of the forest is that forest, a lot of forest birds that were previously quite uncommon, going back to my childhood, which wasn't that long ago, uh, things like uh, pileated woodpecker now becoming quite common uh, in this area. Um, and some of our most spectacular birds are these woodland birds, which we mainly see in migration because they're moving around and moving through in numbers. Once they stop singing, however, nesting in the treetops, even though scarlet tanager is a common bird in our forest here, uh, they're hard to see except during uh, migration. One of the world's great songsters, uh, wood thrush, also a forest species. I've heard lots of nightingales. There are several species of nightingales in the old world. None of them is close to wood thrush in terms of uh, beauty of song, so one of our great songbirds. And then uh, many wonderful insects that, again, we don't see unless maybe we live uh, next to the woods, uh, things like this uh, luna moth. Uh, 
and uh, a wonderful array of fungi. The, uh, uh, the Boston Mycological Club does many forays on Cape Ann because it has a lot of these different uh, habitats and very good for uh, a wide variety of mushrooms. This is something called Amanita muscaria, um, a sort of fly agaric is one of its names. And it's, a, it's poisonous, um, but it's rarely deadly. And uh, <laughs> I'm not encouraging any recipes here or anything like that, but, but it's been widely used going back to Roman times and, and possibly well to, to sort of uh, tribes in Siberia and things. For various purposes, uh, it has a hallucinogen. If you parboil it, you get rid of most of the toxicity. Uh, so people use it in actual food recipes. But it's also used for uh, hallucinogenic purposes. Uh, it was believed by some cultures to give one godlike characters. And who doesn't want a godlike character from time to time? So I, I don't recommend you harvesting that, but it's kind of uh, interesting, very striking, and very common mushroom in this part of, uh, part of the world. Um, within the forest, and the two things kind of go very much together, they're almost inextricable, are various kinds of wetlands. And again, each of these have their own particular habitat value. So this is variously called red maple swamp uh, or forested wetland. Uh, it, it, and it's dominated by trees like red maple that like to have their feet uh, in the water. Uh, it's different from the upland forest in terms of the plant constituencies and all the also things like, for example, wetland species like uh, cardinal flower, uh, but also uh, other species that are water-oriented but also need uh, vegetation. This is uh, a ribbon snake, uh, quite similar to our garter snake, but much more slender and kind of more cleanly colored. And it's definitely a, a, a water-oriented snake. It swims freely, but also climbs in, in the vegetation. Very beautiful uh, little snake, if you like snakes, which I do. Uh, and of course, this magnificent creature, wood duck, another species that was uh, pretty much shot out uh, in the old days, uh, but has come back. Uh, do a lot to people putting out, uh, as people put out bluebird boxes, putting out wood duck boxes. This is a, a species that nests in holes in the trees, so it requires woodpeckers. It also requires um, uh, beavers to flood uh, areas of forest so that there are dead trees and these big uh, holes in the trees. They nest inside these tree cavities, and then the young, uh, when they hatch, can just plop out and right into the water, a uh, very safe and secure way to keep them uh, free from predators. So one of the world's most beautiful ducks. Uh, barred owl, uh, another uh, 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 characteristic species of, uh, of uh, red maple swamp, swamp forest, that kind of thing, with this wonderful uh, call. It's a whoo, 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 which is supposed to say, who cooks for you? <laughs> uh, uh, leave it to you to say whether that's really what it says. But a uh, wonderful owl, and if you live near one, uh, you can't avoid uh, knowing that. Some of these swamps have a constituency of uh, white cedar. Uh, I think you all know about that. I'm sure you know about that from the human history point of view, because very often the cedar swamps were divided into lots and given to people because of the uh, pest-resistant and water-resistant quality of, of the cedar. Very, very sort of hard, hard wood. There are not many trees of this stature left anymore because a lot of them were harvested. Uh, but this is its own special subset of a forested uh, swampland and brings with it its own special creatures, the most special of which is this amazing butterfly. This is something called Hessel's hair streak. It's about the size of a less than, less than the size of a quarter. Uh, and it, it lives mainly right at the top of the, uh, of the white cedars uh, when they're in full leaf. And uh, when we were doing our butterfly atlas uh, a couple of decades ago at Mass Audubon, we would go with binoculars. It's, it's impossible to get into a white cedar swamp uh, without you know, scratching yourself all over. So we would go with binoculars and actually spot these things at the very tops of, of the trees. They're not uncommon. Uh, they just uh, uh, live in a very difficult habitat. Um, this is a vernal pool, again, something that Manchester and Cape Ann in general is, uh, is rich in. And of course, its origin is in the glacier we talked about. As the glacier retreats, it leaves these big globs of dead ice uh, in the outwash plain. Uh, and as that ice melts, and especially if it melts below the water table, it, it lays, uh, leaves this pit with water at the bottom of it. And again, it's a specialized habitat for a variety of things. Fairy shrimp, one of the characteristics of vernal pools is that they have no fish, okay? So what does that mean? That means that, there, that many species are free from that very particular kind of predation and certain things can thrive there. Uh, so these are fairy shrimp, number of species of those. Not true, true shrimp, not even uh, crustaceans actually. Um, and this is a, a dragonfly, 
a spectacular dragonfly, which uh, again occurs uh, and breeds only in uh, vernal pools, would not be able to do so probably if there were fish uh, living there. Um, if you've ever walked through the woods where there are vernal pools in, say, April, and heard what you heard sound like a, a huge flock of ducks quacking, um, you were rather hearing uh, a chorus of wood frogs. Again, these are uh, species that live in the forest uh, during most of the year, but must come down and breed for a very brief period in these vernal pools, because most of these vernal pools dry up uh, by mid to late summer. And this is the kind of the, the emblem species of vernal pools, the spotted salamander or yellow spotted salamander. Again, living underground for most of the year, but on the rainiest nights of the year in late March, early April, sometimes if it's rainy enough, hundreds or thousands of these guys uh, come out of the, uh, their underground burrows and down to these vernal pools uh, to lay their eggs and then go back underground for, uh, for another year. So uh, very important systems. There's a state system for registering vernal pools because, again, they're a potentially endangered uh, habitat in Massachusetts. Here's another little type of wetland called a fen. It's a peatland, kind of like a bog, except with a stream that runs slowly through it, dominated by sedges, also often with uh, some very interesting rare plants. Uh, this is uh, um, a pitcher plant, a uh, carnivorous plant. Uh, uh, a fly or other thing is attracted to a scent. Uh, lands on the surface of this. It has sort of downward pointing spines and the end effect is that whatever gets in there doesn't get out. Uh, <laughs> goes down into a pool of, of acid basically and gets digested by the plant. So this is a plant that lives in a nutrient, very poor habitat, a bog land, a peat land, a fen. Uh, so it has to get its nutrients elsewhere and it does it by essentially eating meat. Okay. And this is a slightly more showy orchid than the small world begonia. Uh, this is something called grass pink. Uh, blooms right about now, actually, in these uh, fen kind of areas. Um, and it's actually quite common. But like a lot of other things, you have to go right at the right season and be willing to get your uh, feet a little wet and muddy. Uh, this peatland, uh, these fens also have, of course, a characteristic species is, is cranberry. And that's the exclusive food plant of a species of butterfly called bog copper. <laughs> OK, so uh, you invited a conservationist to speak, so you have to put up with a couple of minutes of gloom and doom. Uh, I could spend the whole evening doing gloom and doom, and you'd be grateful that I've chosen not to do that. Uh, but I thought I would mention a couple of things that uh, we conservationists are a bit concerned of. Uh, just a quick uh, sort of overview. Again, things that you might not know about so much or not realize how big a problem they are. This one you surely know about <laughs> because you hear about it on the news, uh, both by people who are saying, let's get, do something, and people that are saying, ah, forget about it, it doesn't exist, uh, climate change. Um, there are many, many, virtually all of the habitats I've talked about uh, this evening will be affected by climate change in one way or another. There are some uh, places in North America that at least temporarily uh, may get a little better, that is to say drier areas that may get a little wetter. Uh, however, a lot of dry areas are going to get even drier. Um, so I'll give you a, just a, one particular example of uh, the kind of thing that we would be concerned about here in Manchester. This is a species called the piping plover. It's a federally threatened species. It used to be quite common on all sandy beaches pretty much in Massachusetts. Um, and then the, pl the, the, the population plummeted. Uh, starting around the 1960s, and we did some research and found out that the reason uh, they plummeted was because uh, there was a huge increase in people driving vehicles on the beach. Okay, so piping plover nests in the, what you might call the beach blanket zone, the top of the beach, if you take my drift, up in the sort of sandy uplands above most high tide lines, okay? Uh, they lay their eggs, they just make a little scrape, put their eggs down there, four eggs typically, sit on those eggs, and when the young hatch, Oh, yeah, wait for the arm. Uh, um, they're, call, they're, called, they're called precocial. And that means that as soon as they're out of the egg, they're up and running around. So you picture a barrier beach. Uh, a, a dune buggy goes by, makes tire ruts in the sand. The little chick comes, goes right down to the surf where its food is, down in the intertidal zone, falls into the rut, and the next vehicle that comes along, <laughs> squash. And so that was responsible for this huge decline. Uh, Mass Audubon um, did a lot of things. <laughs> you know, I think of it as the piping plover wars. Uh, and you'll all probably remember the days when uh, Plum Island, sort of when the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge instituted protection for the piping plover. Again, federally threatened species. 
Um, uh, there were some few people that complained about that. Uh, but ultimately, we won that war, and ultimately, uh, most people don't want to squash piping plovers. However, it's now got a new threat, and that threat is sea level rise. These things, uh, half of uh, a good portion of the population, uh, the first brood gets washed out in any case by an excessively high tide, just naturally during the season. And that's why Parker River is sometimes closed all the way till August, till they raise their second brood. Uh, but with sea level rise, there'll be no place for them to go. And there are a number of other species of birds and other organisms that live in that zone. In some places in the world, uh, that habitat can migrate inland. But as we talked about our sort of glacial uh, uh, landscape, there's really not much place for salt marsh and barrier beaches to go. So that's just one example of the many things that happen with, uh, uh, with, with uh, sea level rise and climate change. This is a problem that people kind of think or are kidding themselves has gone away. This is, um, you know, uh, uh, 50s era DDT spraying, okay? Blanket spraying with DDT all over the place. They, they had trucks going out on beaches. There are pictures of kids dancing in the DDT spray and all of this, uh, this kind of thing. Um, and uh, the result was, in some cases, fortunately in one sense, scenes like this. These are birds that were swept up along the streets after the DDT truck had gone through, okay? Uh, fortunately, there were people like Rachel Carson around who got the message like, oh, all these birds fell out of the trees dead, so can this be too good for us? And the result was that in 1972, uh, DDT was banned, at least in this country. Uh, and that was, I mean, among other things, there was a huge drop in the productivity of bald eagles, ospreys, many species of raptors who were getting this concentration of poison because they, you know, ate the, the top of the food chain kind of thing. Um, and basically it was bad, and a lot of those things have recovered. We've got peregrine falcons nesting on city hall, well, not nesting, but roosting on city hall uh, in Gloucester. Bald eagles are stronger than they ever were historically in Massachusetts, like 24 breeding pairs throughout the state. We now, a lot of people think, well, we solved that problem, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, the fact is, there are more toxics in the atmosphere now. Uh, Rachel Carson had it easy, so to speak. Uh, there are huge numbers of toxics. People have been doing studies on this. Our State of the Birds report have documented some of the things that are going on. I, again, I'm not going to dwell on that, but I just wanted to let you know the problem has not been solved. This is American Kestrel. This is one of, used to be a common roadside bird, okay? And here's what our breeding bird atlases have shown. This is where we documented, proved uh, American Kestrel's breeding in Massachusetts back in the first um, uh, breeding bird atlas, 1979-ish, okay? This is the map today. Wow. And one of the main reasons we believe, because there's still a fair amount of Kestrel habitat around, some, some loss, it's true, some loss of farmland habitat, but still, still plenty. They don't need a huge acreage is because um, the insects that they mainly feed on, and perhaps some of the small rodents, are being affected by this incredible stew of chemical pesticides and agricultural uh, herbicides and things like that that we are uh, putting out willy-nilly on the landscape. So problem not gone. Next problem, uh, invasive species. Um, people are confused. I, I showed you this picture of ragged robin. It's not a native species, but it's not invasive. And in fact, probably a number of native bees and uh, uh, Butterflies and things like that use it in various stages of their life history. This is something different. These little cotton balls are something called the Demlock woolly adelgid. It's a sucking insect, comes from Asia, and this is what it does to hemlock forest. And if you, if you spend any time, well, in the Manchester woods, the most striking example for me is Ravenswood Park. If you go to Ravenswood Park, uh, there are these gigantic, these huge, or were, hemlocks, and they're now dying off very, very rapidly. There's a new Asian beetle that's being reintroduced after having been tested, hopefully to affect this, but it's already destroyed the hemlock forests in the Appalachians, and I'm afraid our hemlock forests are, are pretty much doomed. Cats, number one threat to bird life uh, in North America. 2.4 billion birds are killed every year by cats and they are implicated in the ex, uh, extirpation of 33 species of birds, the extinction of 33 species of birds uh, worldwide. Um, also, you know, so the word is keep your cat indoors, please. Uh, it's better for the cats. Uh, the cats are better off indoors because of all the things they can get out there and it's hell on bird life as well as small mammal life and, and things, things of that kind. Um, and windows, 
not just your home picture windows. That's probably not the main culprit, although if you have a way of, of deterring them, and there are several ways of doing that, that did. But high office buildings, during migration, birds get concentrated into, um, they, they are attracted by the lights, especially on foggy nights during migration, where uh, hundreds of thousands of birds may you know, come into city centers, get confused by the lights, exhausted and die, or hit the buildings, or hit the glass, and again, Thousands of birds sometimes are swept up during May and again in the fall at these migrating birds. So windows um, is another major factor. Both of these things, cats and windows, are things, climate change, pretty tough one. But these two are things we could fix if we had the will to do it. So now the good news, uh, and with the good news. Uh, this part of the world, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you, is blessed by uh, having a number of um, conservation organizations that of help protect the, those wonderful resources that I've tried to show you some pictures of uh, this evening. I, I've taken the uh, liberty of putting Mass Audubon first, not necessarily in uh, alphabetical order, but you know, Essex County Greenbelt, the Trustees of Reservations, the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, which kind of oversees uh, the protection of all of these habitats and has produced this wonderful uh, biomap that maps all these different habitats uh, statewide so we know what the priorities for protection is. And then I mentioned the important uh, bird areas uh, program. Uh, and I'll give a, a point of pride to uh, uh, MECT, your own Manchester Essex Conservation Trust, and, uh, of, of which, full disclosure, my wife is the executive director. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, a wonderful uh, organization, uh, uh, much like yours, uh, incredible core of volunteers, uh, protecting these areas, uh, interpreting them, uh, much like you doing uh, many walks and, and, and various kinds of programs, and protecting a great deal of land. This is not a great slide in terms of seeing the Manchester boundaries, but I think you, uh, you kind of know what the Manchester boundaries are. It's kind of like here, here, and here, going out this way. And so all this land in here is protected land, a very large percentage uh, of protected land uh, in Manchester. This is, the, this is the Manchester Club, so that's protected, but it's not exactly conservation land. The rest, however, are uh, protected uh, habitats. And then, this is probably our best hope, actually the best good news. Uh, Mass Audubon prides itself in doing education. We do uh, thousands of programs a year, seeing literally hundreds of thousands of, of, of kids from, we now have preschool programs, including one at the property that I work at in Wenham, uh, all the way through high school and whatever. This is a group of kids that was working on a, an, or, uh, uh, an Orioles uh, conservation project that uh, I started some years ago at Mass Audubon. So there's a little bit about uh, Manchester and the natural history that you all have around you, and uh, I hope you have seen a thing, a few things tonight that you maybe didn't expect. Yeah. Thank you. Well, <laughs> that was that was absolutely a fabulous presentation, yeah. and I'm I'm delighted to say that all of us here and the. The Manchester Historical Museum is making a donation to Mass Audubon yes, in your name, so thank you. For which many thanks. Yeah. yeah. So thanks. I'm glad to do some questions. If I know I haven't kept kept you a while, but if you wanted to questions, I'll tell you what. Let's do this. If you have a question for Chris, join him up here. Bingo. And uh, the rest of you can wander off and look for things. Yes. What? Do, do we need help with chairs? Certainly. Certainly. It's <laughs> a lot of chairs. Okay. If you'd like to chat with Chris, come forward. Right. And thank you all. Thank you.